My name is Betül Kajar. Okay, and uh, what what kind are you a scientist? I am a scientist. I am an evolutionary biologist. Uh huh. And where do you work? I work at Harvard University. Okay, and uh, are we alone in the universe? Are we alone in the universe? Well, and uh, like answering that question um, requires answering um, another question, which is, is life we see around us a result of random process or random processes or a thermodynamically likely configuration of atoms and molecules? In other words, is life random or was life inevitable? What do you think the answer to that is? I'm working on it. <laughs> okay. Do you have any uh, suspicions or? I think that uh, life, at least at the origin level, like life's origins are uh, likely to have occurred over and over again. In which case we would not be alone? I think it would require a certain set of conditions for life to occur over and over again. One idea is that perhaps our planet was a very unique solution or offered a very unique environment for all the conditions to come together. In that case, yes, we are alone. But how likely is that? I don't know, what do you think? I think the probability of our planet's ancient environment that hosted the emergence of life, the hosted the scene for life to emerge, to be a single condition, the universal level, is very unlikely. So there are other places like the early Earth? I don't know myself. We are looking for it. But I think that there's a high probability that, that, that there has to be, right? Think about all the planets that exist in our galaxy. Think about that. Even only in our galaxy, there's just so much. There's so many possibilities. Well, everybody seems to agree that there are lots and lots and lots of possibilities. But what people disagree on is the probability of life. Is it something, sure, probability one, or is it probability 10 to the minus gazillion? I think life is very smart and smarter than us. Biology is very smart. It's very complicated, but perhaps we think that it's complicated because we don't understand it well. So it is likely that life as we see today is not the only way that life could occur. Okay, so can you give me an example of how life, other life might occur? I, well, we, we know that life, at least life as we know, has a way of uh, processing information. Like we've uh, been, you know, in today's meetings too, we've been hearing that life, uh, we, we are not the first to invent reading and writing. Life has been doing this for 3.5 billion years and perhaps more. So is there any only one way to read and write? You know, you can communicate. If the idea is to process information, you can process this information by drawing a picture too, or perhaps by singing a song. So there could be different ways for life to also process itself. So there are different answers to this also. Are we looking for different mechanisms or are we thinking of different chemistries? Okay, so let me get this straight. I ask you, are we alone? And you say what? <laughs> 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 I say it's a very difficult question. Okay. In Why is it difficult? It is difficult <clears throat> because it fundamentally, anything that uh, involves with biology is, is complicated for me to answer in a yes or no question, in a, in a yes or no uh, answer. I cannot but, give a binary answer to that. Well, some people would argue, oh, geochemistry is, and the free energy is so available on Earth that, of course, life will evolve on Earth-like planets. And other people say, oh, no, we're not sure about that, or... Oh. I think, um, well, I'm an astrobiologist, so yes, intuitively, I do think that we are not alone. That's, that's what um, drives my, that's what gets me up at night, you know? Keeps me up at night, gets me off in the bed in the morning, because I do... Aliens keep, get you up in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> Some you know, or so, some people probably stay up all night, but I do get up in the morning for that. And um, I, because I, I do think that um, that life in, in one form or another does exist uh, in, in elsewhere in the universe. And uh, for example, I, I, and I don't think we are too far away from finding it either. Hmm. Do you think this is an important question? The question: Are we alone? 
I think it is an important question. And as many important questions, it is also a scary one. I think any question that um, is involved with understanding why are we here or how life happened to be the way it is, 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 is very big. And the implications could be big also. You know, we humans, we want to understand each other. We want to understand our place on, in the universe. And this is, has been one of the oldest questions that humans asked, right? Could, could it be a scary question because we're social animals and if we were less social, we wouldn't be worried about being alone? Well, we are social, and, but we also have an improved consciousness. We, we, we see the world around us, we observe and we process information all the time. So we, we, as far as we know, are the only species that think about these questions. And we want to have some, we want to find comfort, and we build comfort in our lives by believing in certain answers. And anything that will challenge those answers that makes our lives comfortable will be scary. I take a brief survey and I would guess that at least half the human population doesn't care about the answer to the question, are we alone? Well, Is that, would you agree with that? That not everybody cares about this? Well, if <laughs> at least half the population also doesn't care about Parkinson's disease, but thank God that some scientists do so we can cure it. So... <laughs> okay, okay. Do you have, you must have students who don't care if you have people 20 students and maybe one or two says this is not an important question do you, what do you do to that what do you answer how do you answer that if they think that these questions aren't important I want to understand what makes uh, them think that way what is an important question because they're like pineapple pen pen pineapple apple pen. <laughs> <laughs> well I try not to work with those students but I, I in, at least in my group but in I think the um, if if, I think it is normal for students not to think that these questions are interesting because fundamentally we don't teach um, these concepts as important concepts in science. How do you get them interested? STEM in integration STEM. into high schools and more uh, encouraging the, the role of intuition and the, the significant role of intuition in scientific exploration. Okay. If I gave you a hundred billion dollars with the caveat, you have to use this to money and spend it to try to answer the question, to help answer the question, are we alone, how would you spend it? I think I would start by exploring what we have on our planets in addition to um, improving our ability to detect life and exoplanetary research. For example? In, in, to answer the first one, I, would, um, I think there are a lot of areas on our planet like the ocean itself that we really don't know much about. I think there are a lot of uh, different microbes, uh, different bacteria that figured out very clever ways to survive in really strange environments. And we know very little about those bacteria. And we know their existence in, alone in the past maybe less than 20 decades, if, if any. Some are still So unknown you would invest in submersibles with microscopes or something? I would invest, I would definitely create um, or uh, definitely um, invest on the exploration of our planet and the exploration of weird life in this planet and encourage the research that would focus on that. So extremophile research? Extremophile or extreme environments, anything that survives in there. We call them extremophiles because they are just strange to us, but that doesn't make them extreme. They may think the same about us. Hmm. And that would be half of your money? That would be half of my money. <laughs> and the other half? The other half, uh, I would, I'm, I, I'm, I'm very excited about this, um, the whole uh, uh, exoplanetary research and uh, and what we know after Kepler mission. And I think there are a lot to, um, like, hold on one second. It's like you're making me like I, I can't focus. Yeah. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, I know he's looking and I'm like, right. I just lost my train. All right, that's all right. Sorry. That's right. It can easily be edited out. Okay, I'll answer the second question okay. now, yeah? So with the other 50%, what would you do? All right, so with the other 50%, I, uh, I think we learned so much after uh, and with the Kepler mission. And now we know so many um, stars in which, the, the, around these stars, there could be planets that could host life. I would uh, definitely, um, I would, why do you look at me like that? 
No, no. You oh, would sorry. You would invest in would programs to, like, for example, TPF, Terrestrial Planet Finder, or Darwin to try yeah. space interferometry. I would or? definitely invest in programs that uh, that continue to explore our solar system and and uh, and also encourage biologists to work uh, with physicists and astronomers. Um, so that we have a more realistic idea about our planet's past, which itself is alien. Would you invest in microscopes to try to find nano-aliens? Uh, what do you mean by nano-aliens? Well, oh, these are nano-aliens. These are sub These are smaller than bacteria, and they're advanced aliens, and they go around, and they're everywhere. We just don't know about them. Yeah, so uh, I think definitely tech we are technologically limited at the end of the day, but uh, my colleagues at NASA, the engineers, tell me that we can find and detect anything that you want us to. Just tell us what to look for. <laughs> so so I, I think we, we, we need to first understand what is it that we are looking for. Okay. Now, when you teach students about the question, are we alone, what do you think some of the biggest misconceptions that students have are? Students um, don't think that these questions are relevant to science. Uh, students think that their um, science today is not positioned in a, uh, in a way to answer these questions, that these are simply uh, relevant for ph philosophers or social science perhaps, and just um, or historians or perhaps even um, Egyptian uh, ancient Egyptian philosophers. Egypt Egyptologists? Or Egyptologists. <laughs> <laughs> Right, now, you do research, and how, what is the most relevant part of your research towards, towards answering the question, are we alone? I am interested in understanding the biology of the past. We, when we think of life, uh, when we define life, we are thinking about life we see today, and that's normal because that's life we see today. And we base our assumptions of life's existence and how it looks like based on what we see today on our planet. We often forget that life and evolution itself is an ever-evolving and changing process. It's an extremely historical science. It is fundamentally historical. And our Earth's past is also alien. Say, The fact that it's historical, does that mean that it's irrepeatable, that we shouldn't expect it, the same type of things to evolve elsewhere? Uh, that's what history usually is sometimes referred to as one damn thing after another, as if it's not deterministic, as opposed to physics and chemistry, which is deterministic and hard science. Well, so some would argue that history only repeats itself. So uh, this also is debatable, right? Just because a concept is historical doesn't make it one directional. Yeah, I but um, I think, so for example, if uh, let's not even go to you and me, but let's go to a microbe uh, that is well adapted to, to, uh, to uh, any environmental condition on our planet today. Mm -hmm. If we had the machine to travel in time, let's go not to you know, 20 years into the past, but let's go all the way back to you know, 3 billion years ago. Okay, 3 billion years ago, time Darby machine, right? here we are. Here we are, it's, oh my God, it's so, so much acid in this so environment. Much acid. <laughs> right, acid. I can't live, I cannot live, my bacteria cannot live, we cannot survive. So this makes it alien, right? We don't know much about it anyway, we make these inferences. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, our planet's 3 billion years past is itself alien. So I think understanding our planetary past, not just from the perspective of the, the planet itself or the geology of this planet, but the biology in which the, was occupying this planet is essential. I understand it's a very big and perhaps um, it will take me 200 years to know this, but I am interested in the biology of the past in this sense. What did these bacteria do at the molecular level in these conditions that were so alien to uh, compared to our planet's present How, how does that state. help us answer the question, are we alone? Well, you asked me how my research is related to yes, yes. the How is it related to that question? Because in order to understand whether we are alone, we need to first know what we are looking for. And we limit our knowledge to a very uh, n equals one, n equals one, n equals one today. But life is temporal. So I think if we understand the processes of the past, and particularly the, the biosignatures of the past, if we can perhaps resurrect these biosignatures in the lab, 
we could um, understand a bit more about the conditions of the past that can then be fed into the models that uh, are used to understand whether a planet is habitable or not. Okay. Um, no, I wanted to ask you a question. I was thinking of something else. Did, 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 did. Um, you didn't want to spend any money on SETI. Why because not? you only gave me a hundred. <laughs> okay, I'll give you billion. another hundred billion. Okay. So, so you would spend some of it on SETI then? I, um, I am with Simon Kamei Morris on this one. If there are, if there's intelligent life, they will probably visit us, but will send us a message. So I think it is. Uh, it's, I, I also nostalgically support the idea of listening our um, environment of our planet. So, what is your favorite solution to the Fermi paradox? I'm, I'm not sure if I the can Fermi paradox that is, you know, well, if the, the galaxy is 10, 12 billion years old, yeah. most of the Earth-like planets are older than us by a billion or two billion years. If there is life everywhere, it will evolve intelligence, then it will evolve a technology, and then it will colonize the galaxy, but we don't see any. Where are they? So that's the paradox. Where are they? Is what, what is wrong with that train of reasoning? Because it is still very um, Earth-centric, human-centric, in fact. We think that other civilizations will also follow the same um, progression that we do, or the way we define progression is extremely technology-based. But if you go to 3,000 years ago, you know the ancient Egyptians may have had conditions that's a bit more civilized, civilized than us, but they didn't have iPhones. So just I think that depends on how we define progress. Well, Arthur C. Clarke once said that any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from magic. And there's a German colleague who said, who's Carl Schroeder, he said, no, Arthur, you're wrong. Any sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. And uh, so the idea, I guess, is when you become an advanced civilization, you don't tear down trees, you become sustainable and tree-hugging and environmentally conscious and things like that. Yes. What do you think of that? I am, I am with Arthur C. Clarke. You're not with Carl Schroeder. Who's, who's, Carl Schroeder is the one who says any uh, sufficiently advanced technology will be indistinguishable from nature. I'm sorry, yes, I am with... You're with you know, Carl. It's, it's late. You're with, <laughs> yeah. okay. just, when you listen to this at home, just remember, this was late. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. okay, now, you, have you seen the movie Contact? I, of course, over and over again. Why, oh. why am I an astrobiologist, you think? Okay, three times in that movie with Jodie Foster's character, what was her name? Ellie, right? Ellie had her father, and then her boyfriend, and then I, somebody else. Oh, the little child at the end. Mm -hmm. The question is asked: uh, Do you think there's a, do you think there's anybody out there? And the answer came back from those three people: Well, if if there is no one out there, it would be an awful waste of space. What do you think of that answer? I think it's a very inspirational answer. I think it's a very realistic answer too. So you think that a universe without anybody that's human-like is mm -hmm. a waste of space? I don't think uh, that quote emphasizes that it, the other life form needs to be human. So it has to be able to talk to it. She's looking for signals. They have to be, have technology. But microbes can send signals. You know, microbes talk. Bacteria she's talks. Not, well, she's not looking, looking for microbes, though. I think the implication is when they say anybody, I think they mean somebody who can talk and have a conversation with Well, them. I mean, for the sake of that story, I guess microbes would make it better actors, right? So you're making a story like that, you make it human-centric. So that's normal. Although I know some bacteria that could act better than a lot of actors. But, but I think that, uh, I, I think Carl Sagan did not place humans in the, in the center of that code either. If I'm oh, not mistaken, I, I would guess he did because he, Carl Sagan, repeated over and over again that humans are the way that the universe is becoming aware of itself, and we usually don't associate self-awareness with bacteria. That's what I would assume. I mean, I, I, maybe I just um, spent too much time in the lab, but I think <laughs> <laughs> I, I think if if, bac if a bacteria can um, if a bacterial species can form ecology with a different um, bacterial species or viruses 
and if they can communicate with each other at the chemical level, which is what we do too, right? You and I, we're talking about it's really chemical. Um, why we don't think of that as a form of uh, communication. Okay, do you have any uh, advice for young people, students who are thinking about becoming astrobiologists? Uh, well, we uh, have a, um, I have two, two degrees of advices. One is that they, I encourage that they follow the updates on the NASA Astrobiology website, and we have a, an astrobiology outreach uh, website that we formed uh, named SaganNet after Carl Sagan, uh, where they can reach out to a lot of astrobiologists who study this, these questions from different angles. But most importantly, I think uh, what my advice to anyone who's interested in understanding life at the fundamental level is to not be discouraged by um, the lack of maybe scientists who are also interested in these questions around them. And it's it's not a it's, a, it's a kind of a lonely, it can be a lonely field sometimes. If you don't feel it like that here because we are in an astrobiology meeting and everyone shares this passion with us and it's great, but when we go back to our departments, we can be the only person who is interested in these questions and may feel a bit alone. Alone. <laughs> <laughs> so I, and I think for someone who is at the college level or in grad school level, in postdoc level, who is interested in these things, that's a very big obstacle because we want to fit in too at the same time. So don't be afraid to be the wild child. It's okay. We have, <laughs> <laughs> All right. have, have you ever seen a UFO? Uh, unknown. Un unidentified. Unknown flying findings. <laughs> well, unidentified flying object. Yeah. No, I was I was thinking of a smarter way to put that, but I couldn't come up with an O. Unknown findings of uh, organismic research, but it's the I I have not seen a U UFO. No, I haven't. I'm not one of those lucky ones. <laughs> I presumably you've never been abducted by aliens. Or I did, and this is it. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, yeah, I am being abducted right now. <laughs> okay, I live in a simulation and I'm being abducted. Um, what kind of aliens would you like to meet? Hmm. On an emotional level, not the relational, not, forget about science and reason, let's just talk about emotion. What kind would you like to meet? Different kind. Different. I like diversity. It doesn't uh, scare me. So, what, so it's variety and it doesn't scare you? Yeah. I like the stranger the better. <laughs> can you, what, for example, can you think of something weird that, that I, might be? Well, actually, I just, I just watched the movie, um, it, I want to say the Arrival. Oh. And uh, did, you, did you watch the movie? I think I did, yes, yes. You, I did. did you think? Do you think well, or did the you? The anti gravity was pretty good, I thought. Okay, so you did watch it. <laughs> All right, so, so this whole. Communication. Oh, yes, they were octopus, right? The fingers octopi. They had many. I don't. Were they octopus? I thought they had more than eight legs. Oh, it's, yes. Multiples. Multipla multipods. Multipods. <laughs> so uh, I like that. So that's my that's my kind of alien. Uh, you know. That they were intelligent aliens that could communicate with uh, abstract letters and yeah, pictures, and, right? And time wasn't linear for them. Yeah, right, right. I right. love that. I find that very sophisticated. Because in, if you think about it, our minds work that way too, you know? That when they say, leave the past behind, here's a planet for you where you don't need to leave the past behind, and it's okay. So, um, you know, past is... Past is but they can see into the future past too. Past is in the future. They so can go into the future and look back and then predict which, what's going to happen. Which can happen, you know, right? So when you don't leave your past behind, it's kind of in your future. And in this planet, we don't do that. We, you know, if you do that, we send you to therapy. So okay. in that planet, that's okay. So, um, so you can kind of be in your own world. I, I just different. I liked, I liked the, the temporal or the lack thereof component of that kind of thinking. So I like, that's a good alien. So you like exploring uh, aliens or weird aliens in the context of Hollywood movies then? Well, uh, <laughs> interesting coming from someone who just asking questions about the contact movie. <laughs> but no, I uh, was hoping that people who are watching this also are familiar with this concept, so I was giving my examples based on Hollywood movies. Because I, I, I've criticized Hollywood movies for always showing vertebrates and mammals, for example. Oh, and yeah. And so I, I, but they're always animals, for example. And I said, well, why do aliens have to be animals? Well, okay, so you cannot blame Hollywood movies uh, when you find a lot of scientists who are in this field because they watched the movie Contact. So it is, it's a matter of how your uh, mind translates this information. And besides, they, you know, there are books too, so you can read the movie. <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> and uh, one more time, are, are we alone? We are not alone. I don't want to think so. Oh, you don't want to think so, but you're a scientist. You're not allowed to have wants, are you? Why? I'm a human. You're a human, okay. So you don't want to believe that we're alone. And why don't you want to believe that? I want to believe that there's something else out there. It's much more fun that way. So you're like the X-File guys, I want to believe. I want to believe. It's, <laughs> isn't it more fun? Well, yes, but sometimes hedonism isn't the way to the truth. <laughs> there's only one way to find out. I mean, <laughs> if, right. if I stop believing, then I won't explore it. In order for me to keep exploring, a part of me needs to believe. And, and uh, if scientists, some scientists think that the word believe it doesn't belong to science, well, I'm sorry, but I believe that they're wrong. So okay. Okay. it does. Of course, how can we do all these things without a single trace of belief? Of course, it's right in there. Belief and hope, I guess. Hope well, that you'll they go succeed. hand in hand, of course. You don't, have, you don't have hope if you don't believe that everything, or whatever that you're wishing for, hoping for, is going to come true. And we do believe that these questions are important in science because scientists before us studied these questions. So science, I think, intrinsically is based on belief. So, How about if we found an alien that was peaceful, like you described, but was convinced that we were, that there was no meaning to life in the sense that a lot of people think? And that was their religion. So they're advanced, and their religion is life is meaningless. Would you then convert to their religion or something? And say, then everybody says, oh, life is meaningless. Because in the movie Contact, there was quite a, a, a controversy between this religious believer who, yeah. and then, oh, you're an atheist, we so can't send you in the time machine. Aliens like, you know, the people that we meet on our planet, if we found them somewhere else, is that the question? Well, I, I guess the question was in Contact, there's a science versus religion issue. And, uh, and, I, and I, I guess we don't have much of that in astrobiology, although we just listened to Co Simon Conway Morris, in which religion did play a role, I think, in his interpretation of evolutionary bio biology. Uh, um, but I guess, you know, in Contact, the movie and the book, I guess Carl Sagan describes, oh, okay, Contact, and then there's so many different reactions. Some people think, oh, that's the God. And a matter of fact, I, I have sometimes accused scientists of looking for God because their, look, they, their impression of an advanced alien is omniscience, omnipotent, can do anything, right? And so that, well, that's kind of all, that, that reminds me of God. So what do you think of, of that issue? The, can you just ask me that in one sentence? I guess sentence? The, the issue is, do you think when we meet aliens, there'll be any religious overtones or changes to that type of contact? Well, certainly when they meet us, we will greet them with religious overtones. So like we'll pray to them. It's, it's, it's their problem. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's our. You know, I. I um, they may actually. I'm interested because it will be interesting to see the convergence of religion. I think about this sometimes. That whether if if humans had to you know go through the processes that we did on this planet again, would we invent similar gods? Because it will, gods used to be with multiple. Now it's more single. Um, so there is some kind of evolution in our belief too. We adjust, and that's how religion survives. It you know, kind of needs to adapt. So I think, uh, in that sense, if they are anything like us in the sense of our emotional needs, they probably also um, have ways of uh, comforting themselves. And if that's religion, then that's religion. Some people have said that the best thing for world peace would be for us to find aliens, because then we'd stop fighting each other and worry about having to fight the enemy, the external enemy. Well, um, that person is a very wise person, but we still, at the, this level, you know, our current state of the planet, we don't even, we don't, majority of us sometimes have, uh, what, is everything okay? No, no, I'm sorry. In, in the current state of our world, some, uh, sometimes even a person from another country can be scary and weird and strange and speak a language that we don't know or has a funny name or an accent, you know, so... Um, so we can unite as a group and hate them. So if, if we, <laughs> we don't need to find alien life in order to understand that there's strangeness in this universe and or to learn to welcome the weirdness, right? We, we have that. We, we are different at the end, even though we look the same, we talk the same. So uh, 
I will be very, it will be very interesting, I think, to how we, how we would respond to such a major finding as, as species, how would we react to that?